The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Ben, why is your TV on its side? And also, why is it so big? And what is on your face? Well, Karen, let me answer those questions one by one. That is the Vectrex. It is a vector-based video game system from 1982. Vector means instead of rastering out pixels, it uses the electron beam to draw lines, much like arcade games such as Asteroids and Tempest. Regarding my face, this is the Vectrex 3D Imager. It's one of the rarest video game items in existence. So a friend of mine sent this in because he needs some work done. The Vectrex needs new capacitors because a lot of these old systems, basically the capacitors go bad and then the screens start to basically distort. Regarding this, this is a device that can colorize and 3Dify these images. Wow, that's way ahead of its time. It uses a spinning disk to do it. So there is one spinning disk already installed, but the other spinning disk my friend doesn't have. So he's tasked me with reproducing that disk using 3D printers and lasers. Cool. All right, let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Bat them hatches! Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. It's time to take apart the Vectrex. So this is a CRT, so we need to be careful. I'm going to discharge it before we do anything else. You know what this reminds me of taking apart is an old Macintosh. Even though it came up before the Macintosh, that means it ripped off the Macintosh somehow. That's how influential Apple is. No matter when something was invented, they invented it first. Like, you might think that the Egyptians invented beer. Nope, it was Apple. I will say one thing better about Apple is that the cases were white, which makes it a lot easier to see black screws. There's uh, some feet screwed on the bottom, I wonder if we have to remove those for this to come off. Oh, there's one more screw hiding down by the power plug. USB ports. Who wants those? At Apple, we don't. Oh, wow. There's four different types of screws on this thing, or three different types. There's machine screws, plastic screws, and a long screw. Oh, it's the deadly CRT tube. That stands, wait, did I just say CRT tube? Wow, this is very much like the original Macintosh. It's got a power board, the tube, and then your, uh, basically your CPU at the bottom. Okay, so this is the anode connection here. So I guess what I'm supposed to do, hopefully I don't murder myself in the process, because then the Ben Hex show would be over prematurely. I need to connect to the chassis, which I guess is this, and then a screwdriver, like so. Then, oh yes, I'm supposed to put my, one of my hands behind my back because what really kills you is current going across your heart. And even though I don't have a heart, I wanna be careful. All right, I'm gonna just put my hand in my pocket and this is unplugged. And I guess what you do, doesn't help that this glove makes it smell like a dentist's office. Then you, apparently I stick this under here and it might, it might pop. Please don't murder me. Well, I guess it didn't make it pop at all. Now, this is the uh, power board. We have a nice bridge rectifier here made of diodes. A lot of uh, power things going on here. Of course, I'm holding the high voltage thing in my bare hand. Well, at least there's a lot of uh, individual connectors. So basically, this drives the screen and this is the logic. It's got a Yamaha sound chip, 6502 CPU, a ROM, and a bunch of glue logic. Not too complicated. All right, well, I'm just gonna photograph all these plugs and unplug them, and then uh, pretty much all the electrolytic capacitors are on this board. There's a few here. They don't look too bad, but they should be replaced anyway. I mean, this thing is like, what, 35 years old? We bought a bunch of replacement capacitors for the Vectrix. I mostly got the large ones because all the small stuff we should already have in stock in our bins. I've got this um, not as fancy of a desoldering iron as Felix. You can get one of these from uh, Newark Element 14. They're not too expensive. So it heats up pretty hot, and then you have the vacuum chamber here, basically. Uh, that's pretty much all it is. I've had this one for a while. I've been able to keep it going pretty good. And what I do, <laughs> 
You can extend the tip's life by, <clears throat> I drill them out, I just go and then it clears up the passage. Because basically they, just get, they get filled with gunk. So I'm gonna heat that up. I would say when you're desoldering, you've probably seen like just solder suckers, which just look like this, like a plastic thing. And you're supposed to heat up the solder and go in there and do that. Don't do that. Spend a little bit more money and have the suction and the heat in the same device. Game show. Oh, Berserk. <gasps> ding, 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 ding. Am I supposed to be a human fighting robots? Because I kind of look like Bender from Futurama. Like, see, I've got like a, a barrel body and like spindly legs. <gasps> oh no, it's evil Otto. What? I can't kill him? He is a god. <laughs> like, I love this guy's legs. Doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -doop <laughs> We recapped the Vectrex. Now it's time to figure out how to make a new color disc for the 3D viewer. This is one of the rarest gaming accessories in the world. It's the three-dimensional viewer for the Vectrex. So long before there was an Oculus Rift Vive PlayStation VR, you had this. This, it functions. The issue is it's missing a disc. Okay, so here's how this worked. So, right, it's in front of your eyes. And so once one of your eyes is being blocked off by the, uh, by the black, and then on the right, you have red, green, blue. So it actually synchronizes this disc with the electron beam and it will only draw the blue, then the green, then the red items on screen synchronized to the disc. So basically it colorizes it and by blocking your view half the time, it also puts it into 3D. What I've been tasked with, my mission, should I choose to accept it, is I need to make a replica of this color wheel for the other game. Because there's a third game that's in 3D, but it uses a different color scheme. So 3D Crazy Coaster, 3D Narrow Escape, that just leaves 3D Mindstorm. So basically we have to build another one of these with different colors so we can play one game. And that is vintage video game collecting for you folks. Okay, I googled Vectrex 3D Imager, but look at this one. This must be the other disc. Uh, what does it say on the disc? 3D Minesweeper, I wanna say? Because the discs tell you what they're for. Like this one is for 3D Narrow Escape and 3D Crazy Coaster. So it's pretty much the same colors, although that blue looks a little bit darker. It's just in a different ratio. Hmm, wow, this thing is so rare. There's only like 500 results on YouTube about it. Through the magic of Photoshop. So let's do this. Actually, my old trick from the old days. I put these lines on the screen. So you want to live in a world without lines, huh? And then you put your cursor here and then you drag up and that gives you dun, da, da, circle selection, inverse of selection. I don't care what it's called. Delete it. Now we'll put a center mark on it just like that. I mean, it's going to be 50-50. I guess the main question is 
you know, where are the separations? Trim, get rid of all the transparent pixels. Cool. Oh, also, yeah, I'll need to keep in mind where the timing hole is in reference to these things. All right, I'm gonna do some drawing. All right, here's my representation of the disc. If we use those gels along with this uh, garden variety transparency film or something similar to it, we should be able to be pretty close to the thickness of the original colored disc. Okay, so here's my clutch side. See, I've got little uh, holes in it here, and then I've got the um, square receiver uh, somewhat offset. Hopefully that works. And then on the other side, we have what I call the axle side. And I realize I can't print this in two directions because of, you know, I just can't. So the axle side has little tabs, and that's gonna go through the plastic and into the other side and glue together. That, that's how we basically attach the two sides together. They did something similar with this. Well, this is gonna be another separate piece here, and it's going to basically, uh, that'll fit inside of this disc, and then we'll sandwich everything together. So we'll have the um, axle part, then we'll have the plate for it, the disc, and then the, uh, the clutch side. So hopefully it's, it weighs about the same as well because we don't want to destroy that really, really rare 3D viewer. So I'm going to start 3D printing parts and then we can see how the parts go together while Karen works on the disc. And that's how I lost my face. Ah! Okay, so the ships are green, or the mines, I guess. The mines! My ship is blue. So you probably can't see it on the camera, but these uh, larger ships that I'm blowing up, they're in the foreground, along with these small pieces of debris. And these things in the background, they don't hit me because they're in the background. Mm. So from my point of view, they are behind me. So this system, as you can probably, you probably can see that it's um, using the brightness of the beam to also simulate depth. Uh, I don't see any red. I think the red is just used for the score. Oh, see now it's come, see it came in, okay, yeah. So the score is red. You know how the red was just a little bitty strip? I think since the only thing they use the red for is the score, that's why they only need a small strip of it. So they can spend more time drawing the blue and green objects. Oh no, I'm dragging mines. These mines will tear through your ship like tissue paper. <laughs> I was thinking about it. I think that is the third or fourth best Star Trek movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we have for today. It was pretty fun reproducing these hard to find discs. Yeah, we had to try a bunch of different methods to recreate the disc, but the simplest ended up being the correct answer. Yeah, luckily we had those film gels left over from last fall, and we could cut them in the laser and 3D print, and boom, we have a disc. And then remember when we tried uh, melting the edges? Yeah, the soldering iron didn't work out so well, and a lighter was okay, but sometimes warped it, and looks like yeah. just sandwiching them between the clear plastic works yeah. just fine. Yeah, I mean, you can do this and pull them apart, but they stay together just fine. Basically, we do all the yep. gluing in the center. And we try to keep the glue to a minimum so it doesn't leak out, although you can't see the glue when it's as close to your face anyway. Uh, yeah, so I made uh, basically three copies of the missing disc, and I also made a copy of the normal disc just so we had a spare. What were some of your favorite video game consoles from the early 80s? Do they still work? Have you ever had to repair one? Tell us about it on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Have you been traveling with your goat and thought, wow, I really wish I could put my goat in a tote? <laughs> in today's episode, we have two special guests, Sean and Connor. Well, we're here to make a clock Back in about 2006, my mom was diagnosed with MS, so she has a lot of trouble carrying two-handed objects up a staircase. Okay. So we designed this to be able to hook things like laundry baskets and those sort up the crane so it eliminates that entirely. 